Okay, we're gonna start. Um, our second panel is entitled Revolutionary Change the Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, we have three panelists. Uh, professor Faisal Baba is an assistant professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. In his research and writing, he focuses on constitutional law, human rights law, multiculturalism, national security, and access to justice. Uh, professor uh, professor Haidar Ala Hamoudi is an associate professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. His scholarship focuses on Middle Eastern and Islamic law. Professor Muhammad Tavakoli Targhi is a professor of history and Near and Middle Eastern civilization at the University of Toronto. Our two discussants, um, Mazen Masri is a PhD candidate at Osgoode Hall Law School and a lecturer at the University of Toronto. His research interests are constitutional law and international law. Uh, professor Benjamin Berger is a law professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. His area of specialization are uh, criminal law, constitutional law and theory, law and religion, and law of evidence. So without further ado, please, uh, Professor Faisal Baba. Thank you. The Arab revolutions have seen the rise to power and popularity of Islamic political movements. Political Islam is not a new phenomenon since at least the late 1970s. It has been a contender for support within civil society across the Muslim world. General Zia ul Haq imposed martial law in Pakistan in 1978 and implemented an Islamic political vision through military rule. And then of course Iran in 1979 had its revolution and today exists as a constitutional theocracy and in some important ways, a functioning democracy. In the Arab world, political Islam has largely remained a dissident force. While a division between religion and public life has never been achieved, as it has in other parts of the world, this is a feature of the Arab political culture which is unlikely to significantly change, as uh, Professor Falk was describing this morning. Atheists, agnostics, and the religiously non-aligned who appear on the verge of becoming the majority in most northern countries have been and will remain a small but nonetheless important minority within Arab society. How they are treated as minorities by any democratically elected government will be a test of the revolution's commitment to dignity and freedom, the rallying cry of these revolutions. Because many of the supporters of the ousted leaders were staunch secularists, including many judges and other figures in authority, there remain deep associations in, in these societies between secularism, authoritarianism, and ultranationalism. Unfortunately for years, progressive secular civil society movements were actively and successfully suppressed. Organization was difficult, but religious communities and the mosque, and in the case of Egypt, for example, having a strong institution like Al-Azhar, kept religion on the public policy radar. Nasser secularized Azhar and sought to co-opt it. This dynamic provided an advantage to Islamic movements that other grassroots movements have lacked. So you have decades of repression which forced uh, political opposition in the Arab world towards more traditional and religious sectors of society. The biggest victim of decades of Arab authoritarianism has not been the Islamic movements, but rather the secular alternatives. Thus, while Muslim Brotherhood activists in Egypt, for example, can claim to have suffered persistent attacks, its members tortured and imprisoned, it also gained during these years by the fact that rival secular democratic movements were stifled. But I'd like to talk about questions from a constitutional theory perspective, about Islamically oriented political movements drafting, implementing, and overseeing a modern liberal constitution that will uphold the goals of the revolution namely to protect democracy and protect, uh, to promote democracy and protect the dignity of citizens. As I said, these I think are the stated goals of the Arab revolutions, if we're gonna call them revolutions. Much of Western anxiety over the rise to power of a Nahda in Tunisia and freedom and justice in Egypt has been couched in concepts about commitments to liberal democratic values. How can Islamist parties vindicate the demands of the revolution and not squander the lives lost in the struggle for liberation? Indeed, the siren call of the Arab revolutions has been political autonomy and individual dignity, 
demands for popular sovereignty, anti-corruption, establishment of the rule of law, and political transparency were repeated by both Islamist and secular parties and activists. Western anxieties are fueled by an assumption that the mixing of religion and politics necessarily erodes popular sovereignty and undermines the rule of law. And of course, that it turns human rights into heresy when the state lets the clerics get, the, get their hands onto the law, as we've seen in Iran, the negative example. So I'd like to proceed by sketching out a few uh, observations and comments. Um, first of all, I think this question about the compatibility of democracy with uh, uh, Sharia or with some Islamic uh, conception of, of legal norms ought not to be considered as a clash between Eastern and Western values, the Eastern being the traditional Islamists and the Western being the modern secularists. The truth is that both the secular Arab nationalist tradition and modern political Islamism are products of the Muslim world's encounter with the West, products of colonialism, and they both arise in response to the sense of collective humiliation experienced under colonialism. But they also both emerge as products of pluralism and cosmopolitanism. Both sets of activists and politicians, the Islamist and the secular nationalist, use the language of democracy and rely on its liberties and freedoms to carry out their mission. Secondly, although definitions vary, Islamism, I think, must be understood as a modernist uh, movement, as a modernist interpretation of Islam. This is, of course, unlike the Salafists, who are a traditionalist movement. A brother is just as likely to find a point of commonality with a secular liberal peer in Egypt as he is with a Salafist peer. The brothers were preceded and inspired by figures like Jamal al-Din al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdu, who were 19th century innovators in Islamic uh, political thought, and perhaps the first modern Islamists, though that word uh, was, would not have been used by them uh, or by anybody at the time. Abdu and Afghani spent time in Paris learning about European civilization uh, and, and forming their uh, important ideas. Abdu famously wrote, quote, I went to the West and saw Islam but no Muslims. I got back to the East and saw Muslims but not Islam. This was a powerful critique and call for action and this early resistance to British interference in Egypt was at once pluralist, progressive, and religious. The brothers, founded by Hassan al-Banna in 1928, began as a grassroots movement, blending their doctrine of national liberation from British colonial control with personal piety. Egypt was richly diverse in such movements, but within 10 years, the brothers were the most successful at establishing local branches across the entire country and even spreading beyond the borders of Egypt. They used existing social networks to spread their membership and build fierce loyalty. Banna, the founder, was at once a traditionalist and an innovator. For the Salafists, meanwhile, innovation, or bid'ah, is equivalent to apostasy. It's an important distinction. Innovation was embraced by the brothers. It's rejected by the Salafists. Banna took preaching from the pulpit to the streets and the coffee houses. In many ways, he was seen to have democratized religion. Uh, incidentally, this was a uniquely Sunni possibility because of the lack of an established clergy, unlike in the Shia tradition. Finally, a further piece of historical context. I don't want to get into making normative claims about how Sharia should properly be interpreted or defined, but I will say that if one's interested in analyzing its meaning, we must look to the political context in which the foundational Islamic texts and doctrines were developed. Let's recall that in the seventh century, Arabia was situated between two great but decaying empires, the Byzantine Romans and the Persian Sassanids, together splitting and fighting over the world from Spain to Mongolia. These two powers were the model of empire decay and the height of injustice. They practiced forced labor, neglect, ruthless authority. Thus, the core political message of early Islam was built to limit human political power and to develop a just society based on grassroots participation. This is, I think, Abul Fadl's uh, natural justice conception of Sharia. A strong doctrine of God's supremacy was necessary to counter the claims 
of emperors and kings who ascribed themselves godlike powers. So the point here is that popular resistance to injustice and tyranny is inherent in whatever interpretation of Sharia one uses. Now, there may be different interpretations and more importantly, different applications, uh, and, and I don't have time to get into that, and I don't think it's particularly relevant uh, for the points that I'd like to make. The links between law, revolution, and Islam are recurrent throughout Islamic history. And at key moments, religion has always been a source of normative weight for resistance to political oppression. So while the Brotherhood represented a novel form of political, of Islamic political activism, the mix of grassroots political rebelliousness with personal religious observ observance was a natural one. Indeed, some have argued that the essential mandate of Islamic law is at its core a liberation or revolutionary theology. So we arrive at the question, is there anything objectionable on its face with the inclusion of a reference to Sharia in a modern liberal democratic constitution. In other words, does reference to Sharia in a constitution make it less democratic? It's worth noting that the absence of a reference to Sharia does not guarantee an absence of religion or religious favoritism from law. Take the US or Turkey, for example. Nor does the presence of a Sharia clause determine theocratic tendencies. Take pre-revolutionary Egypt, which has had a Sharia clause uh, uh, in, its, in its constitution. Conceptually, then, Sharia and democracy are both concepts with indeterminate meaning, making it impossible to determine with categorical clarity their mutual exclusivity. In other words, we must be realistic and consequentialist in assessing uh, the answer to the question. It has to be shown and proved that the mere inclusion of reference to Sharia undermines democracy, and I'm not sure that it has been. If we define a constitution as a prescriber and limiter of state power through the institutions of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, we still need, as all constitutions do, interpretive values. Those values can be informed by various sources. Recent debates between Tariq Ramadan and Abdullahi and Naim have been interesting. They've been debating, they've been disagreeing on whether religious values can or should ever inform or constitute such foundational values. Ramadan argues, of course, as long as the values, the, the religious values are consistent with civic values, it's okay. And Naim argues that only civic values should be constitutionalized. If a norm derives from a religious principle, it's illegitimate unless it can be articulated in a purely secular way. The debate, I think, is in many ways semantic, and distinct, distinctions between the Muslim world and Western democracies are overblown. God and Christian religious values are invoked in numerous constitutions around the world in, in countries that we routinely consider to be democratic. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. Germany, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, among others, have explicit reference to God in their constitutions. In Ireland, the preamble of their constitution invokes God, Jesus, and the Trinity. Natural law has been used by courts to articulate unwritten constitutional principles. Substantive clauses of the constitution, of the Irish constitution, put all powers of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial, under God, quote, under God. That's in Article 6 of the Constitution. In Greece, the birthplace of Western democracy, the Constitution itself invokes both God and the Christian Trinity. In Canada, God is in our preamble. And although the BC Court of Appeal has declared it a dead letter in sharp, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has yet to clarify this point. Prior to the adoption of the Charter, Parliament was supreme. And of course, parliamentarians swear an oath to the Queen who, in addition to being a political sovereign, is the official head of the Church of England. Now, although in the US, there's no reference to God in the Constitution, and the non-establishment principle requires a clean separation between church and state, this hasn't always been achieved. And more than a dozen state constitutions include explicit references to God. In all of these constitutions that include reference to natural law or to the divine uh, or principles of a supreme being, uh, as something higher than the Constitution or something from which the Constitution is derived, uh, 
They, the purpose appears to be to impose moral constraints on the interpretation and exercise of human political power. If we accept that democracy needs internal normative checks, the relationship between religion or faith and the state is already more integrated than we might otherwise assume. Even in the US, official secularism has not diminished the importance of God and faith-based norms in many aspects of public administration and public life. While many such issues are hotly contested, the point is that we can't assume that religion has no place in constitutional politics. Finally, turning to the idea of democracy itself, I want to make just a couple of points. First, democracy can create the conditions for popular movements to assume a more prominent public role and for previously under, underground actors and ideas to enter mainstream politics. Thus, while democratic processes have empowered Islamic social and political movements, constitutional values can create normative limits on the potential scope and content of Islamic law. How democratic institutions operate in reality is what will determine whether religion is being deployed towards democratic ends or for political domination and minority oppression. We need, as I said, a consequentialist approach. I'd like to argue that there are three conditions of democracy that any inclusion of Sharia ought to promote, not stifle. These conditions are legitimacy, viability, and integrity. Legitimacy, of course, uh, relates to uh, having elections, reflecting the popular will, and the purpose, the importance of this, is to promote popular sovereignty and civilian control of state institutions. Regarding integrity, the importance of this is, is that government actions should not only technically comply with the processes and structures of institutionalized democracy, but also promote the spirit and goals of democracy. The challenge is that popular sovereignty and civilian control are majoritarian forces. You need a theory of equality to protect counter-majoritarian interests. Under autocracy and dictatorship, majority-minority dynamics are more insulated by state authority. Popular sovereignty necessarily puts minorities at risk, and the state must, as a matter of integrity, I would argue, develop a framework for this. Finally, the importance of viability. Whatever framework is developed uh, to implement popular sovereignty through democratic institutions must be viable. Whatever arrangements of rights and protections to mitigate the risks that popular sovereignty brings must also be viable. Rights should have remedies, elections must be practical and fair, constitutional arrangements should work. The value of viability requires time and empirical study to determine. Thus, it's not really enforceable by popular expressions or counter-revolutions. Regarding Egypt today, I'm not sure it's clear that these conditions are not being met by the current government, although there's significant concerns about integrity. The lean towards authoritarianism and failing to respect the spirit of democracy while using its institutions for political advantage is a genuine concern. There was a rush to adopt a constitution with little consultation and resulting in a poorly drafted document. When you look at the process that a country like South Africa went through, uh, when it was developing its new, its new constitution after emerging from decades of political repression, Egypt's process was a joke. To resolve what is potentially a constitutional crisis in Egypt, it may be useful to look at a different example in a neighboring country. And in the last minute or two that I have, I want to suggest the Israel option as a third way. Israel has no formal constitution. Its Declaration of Independence, as well as uh, the United Nations General Resolution 181, which proposed the establishment of a Jewish state, required that the state adopt a democratic constitution. It never did. This is the result of loggerheads between the religious establishment and the secular, uh, the secular political elites. Who believe, so you've, you had the religious establishment on the one hand who believed that only scripture can be supreme law, and of course the founding fathers who were secular liberals. Israel inherited parliamentary supremacy from Britain and its legislature was supreme in practice. It developed a series of basic laws over time and in many ways reflected uh, changing values through those laws. 
The advantage of this system, I think, is, is that it defers the tough questions and it leaves open-ended open values to be interpreted in, in specific circumstances. The question of whether religious law is supreme or secular civic principles are supreme is one which gets set aside and allows everybody to believe that it can be whatever they want it to be. An Israeli today could plausibly claim, and many do, that no law is higher than the Bible. Meanwhile, one could also plausibly claim that Israel is a functioning liberal democracy, though many agree with, disagree with that too. Separate zones of jurisdiction allow for different systems of law to prevail. So in Israel, the national Sharia court oversees family law matters involving Israeli Muslims. In a decision of the Israeli Supreme Court handed down called Bavli, the court ruled that all religious tribunals are subject to review by the Supreme Court and could be subject to secular norms, such as equal distribution of family wealth. Following Bavli, the rabbinical courts announced that they would not accept the ruling. They rejected it. They argued that their legitimacy was based on religious law and that the state had no authority uh, to interfere in it. Yet, the record shows that since that court case, the rabbinical courts have in fact tailored their interpretations of religious law to fit, in many ways, the civil standards developed in the secular courts ever since. So you have parallel systems of law operating that allow different people uh, to believe different things uh, about the law. The power of the courts in such a system becomes significant, and this is the, this is the risk. Rand Herschel's well-known book, Towards Juristocracy, is largely a reflection of his empirical work tracing this in Israel and then applying the model to other common law countries where courts are, in his view, asserting greater hegemonic power not for purposes of promoting democracy but to insulate policy from legislative control and that it's therefore uh, undemocratic. But I think in a context with deep divisions between the secular and the religious, entrusting the courts to effectively mediate and lead may not be a bad strategy, at least in the short term. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank the organizers of the uh, uh, of this conference for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak and to um, visit Toronto for the first time. Also, uh, my wife and I just had a child uh, two months ago, so I also want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to get eight hours of uninterrupted uh, sleep. Uh, my wife, by the way, does not thank any of you for anything. Um, let's see. Uh, I wanted to make uh, three points, I think, in the short 20 minutes uh, that I have. Uh, the first of them is that the rule of law legality, meaning adherence to the rule of law, was uh, and is an important part of these Arab revolutions, transformations, however you, you, you want to describe it. Um, the second is that it has taken something of a pathological form in a lot of these societies, and I'll use Egypt as the specific example. And the third is that while that's bad, it's not necessarily catastrophically bad. It's not, uh, it's not something that is uh, 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 irreversible. Um, so if I want to start with the first point, I, I'm not going to dwell on this. Professor Abu had talked about this already, and I, and I think I uh, uh, support uh, uh, um, uh, just about uh, uh, everything she said. I, I, uh, I copy a lot of her ideas. But, um, uh, but the, uh, I do think that it is, uh, it, it, if I could just sort of give one interesting, I think, anecdote. Um, Tunisia, where this whole thing started, when bin Ali was deposed, when he left the country, uh, the first thing that happened, and this was actually quite interesting, was that the Prime Minister, Renucci, not the Nehta Renucci, different one, um, said uh, that he was assuming the presidency and that he was going to take some transition process. And that was actually held to be quite unacceptable uh, by uh, just about everybody. What bought the Tunisian system time to adapt was the Tunisian Supreme Constitutional Court, a constitutional court, declaring that it actually shouldn't be Renucci because he was the Prime Minister, and that under the Tunisian Constitution, it had to be the Vice President who takes over the President's position in the vacancy of the president. It's an attempt at legal continuity, and it was enough to buy time. Was that the ultimate goal of the revolutionaries? Of course it wasn't. But neither was it the ultimate goal of Mandela to uh, adopt legal continuity either. And yet legal continuity was used in South Africa. It was used in Spain after the death of Franco. Indeed, all of the Eastern European, we call them velvet revolution, or Havel did in the context of uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, all of them preserved some form of legal continuity. I think it's a point that's sort of worth emphasizing because um, uh, 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 we've been talking about revolution as involving 
a criminal act. And in a lot of these cases, it really was not a criminal act. It was uh, 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 the Berlin fall, Wall falls and a series of formally legal processes take, take place to amend the Constitution through the adoption of roundtables, which are formal, which adopt formal amendments to an existing Constitution. And from there, we get a, a permanent Constitution. Um, uh, uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is a long process, and it is a process that involves a, an entire transformation regime. But it is at a stark contrast to, say, what happened in Iran, where there is uh, considerably more contempt for the Shah's legal regime uh, by, the, uh, by the Ayatollah Khomeini. The idea that you would maintain this is, uh, is out of the question. In any event, leaving aside the question of legal continuity, because it wasn't adopted in Egypt, as I'll point out in a minute, and certainly it's almost impossible to adopt in a, in a state like, uh, uh, like Libya, because I don't think anybody understands this Jamahiri uh, thing that Qadhafi had going. Um, uh, 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 the idea that one adopts legal processes to achieve the transformation, and, and, and that the, the, the process of the transformation has to itself adhere to rules of legality, even if we rupture at one point, rules of legality follow therefrom. And from there, we're going to create a rule of law state, I think was something that was broadly accepted as a, as a, as a, as a uh, premise there. Well, again, uh, in, in, in these Arab transformations, again, it's not something um, I'm going to dwell on. I'll sort of accept it as a premise. The second point that I wanted to make was that it really has taken something of a pathological form uh, in the context of the Arab world. What do I mean by that? Well, if we look at Egypt, the first thing that happened upon Mubarak's uh, 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 departure was that the, uh, uh, the, the the Supreme Council of Armed Forces declared that uh, you know it, it started to issue a series of constitutional declarations. It did one immediately upon Mubarak's departure, saying the constitution is suspended, and here's what we're going to do: a decision to break with legality, a decision to sort of. Uh, 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 not to continue, uh, not to have legal continuity. The first step wasn't necessarily devoid of any legitimacy at the, at, the, at the time. The army was certainly well regarded. But what you had after that were a series of constitutional declarations, one after the other, um, which started to uh, uh, undermine, to say the least, the legitimacy uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of the SCAF to be able to enact these sorts of declarations. So you start in February of 2011 and the Constitution is suspended. Then they issue a, a constitutional declaration that more or less creates a new Constitution. A lot of people seem to think that, well, there was a referendum and they adopted the changes to the Constitution there. That's true, but they did a few other things that sort of cemented their own power. Then you had a constitutional declaration that had something to do with how elections were going to be formed in September of 2011. And then in November of 2011, they had adjust that constitutional declaration because what about the Egyptians abroad and the Constitution said that everything had to be supervised by a judiciary and that can't be done abroad so we're gonna have to change the Constitution again for consulates uh, and 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 then uh, in uh, in June uh, well a little bit the Supreme Constitutional Court declares that the Constitution the election law is unconstitutional under the Constitution as created by the Military Council because it doesn't have enough room for independence a another constitutional declaration comes forward just before the election that more or less describes the president as having no power at all. Of course, the president, Morsi, then gets elected and then issues his own series of constitutional declarations in which he assumes power and voids the constitutional declarations of the SCAF and in November of 2012 adopts a, 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 um, a uh, constitutional declaration that uh, not only sort of finalizes the constitution-making process, but also immunizes it from any form of uh, judicial review. I could answer, I would answer, not could, would answer Professor Abouad's question of is, if there was any way to maintain a veneer of legality on the part of the constitutional court as being an emphatic no, mainly because I just don't see any sort of recognizable form of legality at work. I don't know who can issue these constitutional declarations and who cannot, and how you could make a determination, excuse me, a determination about who could or couldn't uh, under any sort of veneer of being objectively legal just because there has been such a, 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 a pathological distortion of anything re resembling a, a recognizable uh, legal uh, process. And I think it's there where I might uh, disagree with uh, 
Professor Falk, which probably makes me wrong, but that's okay. I'll go ahead and do it anyway. Um, and I do think that one can be a committed Democrat and have some serious concerns about the manner in which this Constitution was adopted. It is true that Morsi was popularly elected, but the extent to which one, can one be a committed Democrat and say that the uh, immunizing a constitutional, creating a constitutional process, having been elected, effectively writing one's own interim constitution to create a constitutional process, or at least confirm one, and then to immunize it from judicial review, and then have that constitutional process as determined by one person, effectively, uh, albeit an elected person, still a person, whether one can be a committed Democrat and be seriously concerned about the legitimacy of the process by which that entire, pro uh, that entire thing unfolded, I think one could be. I mean, I think one could cast some serious doubt about the legitimacy of this entire exercise, given the manner in which it took place. Now, it is fair to say, and it is quite possible, and certainly the Muslim Brotherhood would say, we didn't have any alternative, the courts were just going to stand in our way and, and, and hold us up forever, the National Salvation Front just isn't interested in the results of election. Um, and that may well be or may not be. It's hard to know. It's impossible to know because it was, I, I'll adopt Professor Baba's uh, point, and I think I agree uh, with it as well. It was, uh, it was a rushed process, and it was a speedy process, and it was a process that didn't really uh, uh, develop from any form of, of, uh, of consensus. And that, I think, is the pathological uh, uh, phenomenon that I think defines a lot of these uh, transformations, sort of making up the rules as one goes along. The courts are involved, but they're highly politicized. I think they're inevitably politicized because this is ultimately a political exercise at which any attempt to create a veneer of legality has been stripped. Um, and uh, and uh, 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 it is, uh, it is a law, well, I mean, it's not even law masquerading as politics. It's law attempting to masquerade as politics and doing it rather badly. Why do I think, well, obviously, one can say why it's bad. I mean, why it's bad is obvious. It exacerbates existing divisions. Uh, those who uh, feel left out of this constitutional process uh, 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 feel as if uh, uh, a process has been imposed upon them. This is not a, a consensual constitutional process. This is an imposition. Um, so it's, you know, the bad part of it is, is easy enough. Uh, the, why do I think it's not necessarily disastrous? Um, I think that with the inherent the rising importance of legality and revolutions that has really taken place, I think largely as a result of the transformations in Eastern Europe, but they certainly existed in the, um, in the uh, uh, Arab world as well. Um, one can, while it would be good to adhere to rule of law processes, I think, in order to achieve these transformations. One can, I think, overemphasize them. One can uh, uh, take them more, uh, perhaps more uh, 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 seriously than they need to be taken, or, or at least ascribe to them, maybe not take them more seriously, but ascribe to them more permanent effects than needs to be the case. That is to say that if minority groups find within an existing constitution the means and mechanisms by which they can advance their own political interests, notwithstanding the fact that it was once imposed upon them, they can find their ways to make peace with it. It does require um, uh, 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 some level of ambiguity or flexibility in the text. Um, that is to say, uh, one can have, uh, while one cannot have, uh, can avoid a constitution at all, I don't know if it's practical in the Arab Spring or not, I've never thought about it, one can also adopt a constitution with fairly open-ended terms. <laughs> Uh, and, and when that happens, uh, it, it is certainly possible for a group that once felt imposed upon to use the Constitution to advance its interests. My two examples are going to be Iraq's 2005 Constitution uh, and Egypt's own 1923 Constitution. Iraq's 2005 Constitution, well, it's clear that this is a pathological process as well. Andrew Arado describes it that way, but that's... You know, uh, I don't know if that's copying his idea or just stating the obvious. You have an American occupation. You have 25 hand-picked advisors for the United States. They write an interim constitution using two uh, Iraqis who are entirely American-trained lawyers who know next to nothing about uh, Iraqi law. Uh, the forget to go and check with uh, uh, Grand Ayatollah Sistani, who tells them he thinks this is the worst thing he's ever seen, and he doesn't want the Security Council to even mention this interim constitution, it's so bad. And this is the interim constitution under which uh, 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 everything is supposed to proceed. Later on, the Sunnis boycott the elections that are supposed to lead to the interim constitutional body. The constitutional body doesn't even get to meet until June. The Sunnis don't even get joined in until July, and they're not even elected, they're just Folks, the Americans sort of tried to push into the Constitutional Council to give it some sort of veneer of legitimacy. A constitution is rushed through in something like 60 days. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, the Sunni uh, population votes against it in very large numbers um, and uh, uh, is disenchanted with the state and has 
remain so since. One thing I would say, I would say the same thing I could say about the National Salvation Front, it is possible, and certainly the Shiites and the Kurds would say, there is nothing that would have satisfied the Sunni population, just as there is nothing that would satisfy the broader Arab population other than the continued subjugation of Sunnis and Kurds. Unless they, we accept second-class citizenship status, you're going to say we sold ourselves to the Iranians because you won't accept us as full citizens of the state, and you never have and you never will. That it is impossible to know whether or not that's true when you force through a constitution in 45 days, uh, as opposed to the period of years that it took to take the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, South African constitution. This process was clearly uh, hugely flawed. Interestingly enough, though, only five years later, in March of 2010, when there were elections, the Sunni list, led by a secular, na it was really a secular nationalist list, but overwhelmingly Sunni in terms of its composition, led by a secular nationalist, Shi, Ayad Alawi, ended up getting the most votes in the context of the 2010 national elections, and found within the Constitution a provision that gave them the right to form the government under that circumstance. And all of a sudden, the kinds of caustic remarks you had heard about the Constitution. It's American imposed, it was imposed upon us, it's Iranian, it's written by an American Jew, which isn't true. It has done wonders for Noah Feldman's career, it still isn't true. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, what you ended up with uh, is, uh, is uh, a, 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 a dropping of that rhetoric in favor of the Constitution gives us the opportunity to form the government, you have to give it to us. Now they didn't get it, the Supreme Constitution or the Federal Supreme Court sort of turned them down. But ever since that moment and ever since they sort of saw that opportunity to use the Constitution, as disaffected as Sunnis are with the state because of debathification, because because of marginalization, because of uh, uh, any number of, of, of factors, right? Um, the criticism of the Constitution as American imposed has largely dropped away, almost entirely dropped away, frankly. And the criticisms of the Iraqi state that are now directed by Sunnis in fairly large demonstrations, I don't mean to say that we've gone anywhere close to the national reconciliation, but I will say that the criticism of the Constitution as having been imposed by whoever I mean, in reality, Shiites and Kurds, but you know, whoever it was alleged to be, um, has uh, has largely uh, has largely uh, uh, dissipated. The final example that I'll give, um, uh, which is perfect because I only have five minutes, um, is the 1923 Constitution of Egypt. What you had in 1920, well, 1922, the British actually attempted uh, at some point to negotiate with the Wefid Party, which was the uh, Zaghloul's sort of leading. Uh, Egyptian popular movement uh, at the time uh, uh, regarding a constitution for the independence of Egypt. Those discussions went nowhere, mainly because the British weren't willing to give up on the concessions that they demanded for concessions, all of which had to do with foreign policy. And Zaghloul said, there's no way. We are independent. We're not going to be a protectorate uh, of, of, of the United Kingdom, uh, uh, and we're not going to negotiate a constitution on that basis. So the British uh, at some point just gave up and handed it over to the king. Uh, and the king handpicked a series of advisors, described by Zaghloul himself as a committee of criminals and delinquents. They wrote a constitution over the Weft's objection. The Weft had boycotted the thing. And there was nothing to boycott, really. There was no referendum at all. Uh, it, it came with the first seating of parliament. And the feeling was this constitution's doomed. It has no popular support. Interestingly, two years later, when the king's premier sought to uh, uh, suspend the Constitution. It was Zaghloul, and it was the Wefid who came back and said, wait a minute, under the Constitution, we want an election. Under the Constitution, we're entitled to rule. What is really the lesson of these things? Not that one should adopt, and well, I should actually say that Constitution not only survived from 1923 until, until Nasser took over, but is described in Egypt, and one can just go pick up a magazine about the uh, a newspaper like the Shakal al or anything, and read editorials about how Zaghloul forced upon the British the brilliant 1923 Constitution, which is completely counter-historical. But nonetheless, one continues to hear praises of the 1923 Constitution, a Constitution that actually lasted uh, uh, several decades. Um, I think the lesson is that constitutional processes by themselves, even if they don't adhere to rules of legality, they should. It would certainly do a lot to reduce uh, 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 tensions in highly divided societies. But even to the extent that they don't, recovery from those sorts of processes uh, is, uh, is at least uh, possible. So with that, I'll conclude. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I am 
a student of revolution, more specifically Iranian revolution, and for that two Iranian revolution, the revolution of 1905 and the revolution of 1979. I have been mainly dissatisfied with the way the revolutions are talked about. The Iranian constitutional revolution becomes uh, an account of Iranian intellectuals who have been sort of influenced by West and Western democracy, Western ideas, importing it to Iran and becomes a constitutional revolution. And then the Islamic revolution of 1979 is basically a story of Islamist, Ayatollah Khomeini, and people around him who come and make the revolution. If you think of revolutions, revolutions at the very core of them, uh, if you put it in the context of traditional the, the, the historical revolutions, they bring it to an end an ancien regime, a regime that has been mainly pastoral, thinks of itself as a shepherd of the nation and the people. Revolutions, with the French Revolution, you have the beginning of the whole notion of citizenship. Are the citizens, through their daily plebiscites, demonstrations, that they bring the Ancien Regime to an end? The question that has been haunting me is that what is that moment of enthusiasm that gets the public into the street, streets, and whether that moment of enthusiasm that Kant has explained in an essay on the contest of faculties reflecting on the, on the French um, Revolution, whether that moment of enthusiasm has a logic. Kant talks about that logic and unfolds it in the context of a universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view and anticipating emergence of these democratic, this constitutional mode of government in an internationally sort of regulated kind of a, a system. But what I am interested, I have been thinking is that what is that logic that people have and what is that future, that horizon of expectation, uh, the, uh, Professor Falk talked about it as the horizon of desire. What is that horizon of expectation from the point of view of uh, Reinhold Koselec that shapes that future that people see that enthuses them and puts them into the street? When looking at the Iranian constitutional revolution, I've come to conclude that that structure, that mode of imagination, that then translates into legal uh, legislative uh, processes, comes to view the society, the ancien regime that viewed itself as a shepherd, as ill, as sick, about to die. And in a sense, the Iranian revolution, the constitutional revolution of 1909, five to nine, becomes an account of how to cure the nation. And because of that, most political, potent political concepts, terminology of the Iranian constitutional revolution, including the whole notion of law, qanun, comes from medical sciences. And uh, not only the whole, no the, the concept of revolution that in the, in the European context comes from astron uh, astronomy, in the case of Persian Arabic, it comes from medical sciences and an envelope basically meaning vomiting. And, and I have worked on these concepts and the interplay, the close interplay between the medical texts written in late 19th century Iran and the political discourse that emerges. And then when the revolution succeeds and the parliament is shaped, the legislations all have to do with the curing of the nation, restoring the health of the nation and, and enabling it and, and through and nursing it to to sort of rejuvenation of and recovery of its ancient health. Now, doing the same thing to the Iranian revolution of 1979, I came increasingly to conclude that first of all, you cannot do a really a vernacular understanding of, of, uh, of revolution and revolutionary discourse, particularly the Islamist, Islamic discourse. The Iranian Islamic discourse emerges intensely in the context of, of Cold War. And it's during the Cold War that Islamists begun, begun to conceptualize 
Islam as a third way between communism and capitalism. They articulate it as a system, an independent system. The system up to the Iranian Revolution of 1979 was a, a a biological system, and limbs and everything else, and the ancien regime of Pahlavi ancien regime, the Shah's regime, was viewed as a sick, as ill, and morally corrupt, morally ill, and in order to cure it, Islam was viewed as a mode of vaccinating the body that is ill and recovering it. But once the revolution succeeds, there is an interesting shift this notion of the system, Islam as a system. Earlier, during the, uh, prior to the revolution, it becomes increasingly conceptualized as an engineering system. And my argument then is that there is, the, uh, and actually it, it starts this shift from a medical mode of thinking, conceptualizing and restoring the, the society to this medical constructional a mode happens through the very first legislation, one of the very first legislations of the Islamic Republic, whereas earlier they thought of the members of the high-ranking members of the ancien regime as cancer within the body politic that they had to be purged, surgically removed. Sometime in late, mid-1979, late 79, they began to introduce the concept of reconstruction, basazi, reconstructing human resources, reconstructing uh, governmental offices, reconstructing factories, reconstructing the educational system, and all of a sudden, you have the disposing of, of, of uh, medical terminology, medical imagination, medical logic into a monologic engineering system that is conceived of as Islam. Islam, with all of its sort of uh, Islamic um, um, uh, jurisprudence, Islamic interpretations of the Quran, in Kalam and, and theology and everything, they have had historically different logics and they have folded differently, but with the imposition of this engineering logic, it becomes a unified system that is referred to as tohidi, as monotheistic, monist sort of system, and the Islamic Republic begins to unfold this. Now, the key argument that I have then here is that whereas the Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1905 led to the rise of the physicians to political offices, and if you look at many of the people who were elected into parliament uh, the, uh, in 1906, 1907, increasingly and uh, became um, physicians, doctors. With the Iranian Revolution of 1979, most people that enter into the parliament and people who c become prime ministers and later on presidents and, and become ministers within the cabinet members within the Islamic Republic, almost all of them become engineers. And it's here that I have this argument, and I want to just give you a taste of what the mode of analysis that I have. So I argue that the rise of Shi'i clerics to power since 1979 Islamic Revolution coincided with the political rise of engineers and the ascendancy of engineering schools in Iran. We are all obsessed with the clerics and seminary schools, but forget that there is this there is another ally that enables the clerics. With the Islamic revolutionary commitment to the building of a divinely inspired society on the eve of the revolution, the analytical concepts of architectural and system engineering began to provide the foundation for a highly contested, for a highly contested epistemic shift from an organic and curative to a synthetic and constructional conception of religion, politics, and culture. This epistemic shift was intimately linked to the transformation of dissident Shiism into a governmentalized 
jurisprudence, theology, and, um, and, and theology, this process also involved the transition from individuated to institutionalized conception of religious authority. For those of you who are familiar with the Islamic uh, juridical concepts, particularly within Shiism, the whole notion of ijtihad and mujtahid, these are the religious scholars. They were the individuals, they were the site of law and legislation. All of that has withered away with the Islamic Republic. All of it has become institutionalized. You no longer have, while the concept of ayatollah and mujtahid are still used, mujtahid has become really equivalent of a PhD in, uh, in seminary, seminary studies and does, does no longer has that kind of religious authority that was associated with it. As a result of a mutually enabling marriage of convenience between seminarians and engineers, since the Islamic Revolution of 1979, the rhetoric of engineering has become increasingly hegemonic in the conceptualization, description, and explanation of politics. The unique concepts of cultural engineering, religious re-engineering, mind engineering, soul engineering, and even engineering spirituality are expressive of a deep figurative transformation of political imagination and political discourse, which since the 19, late 19th century, as I explained, stemmed from uh, medical sciences. The prevalence of engineering and architectural imagination involved the coupling of Islamic terms with concepts such as building, sazi, rebuilding, buzz sazi, uh, drafting, parsing, mapping, and geometry, and more importantly, recently, observation, rasad, which had been used until very, very recently for uh, astronomical observation and observatories, rasad khane, but now it has become part of a positive, positivist concept of the uh, 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 Islamic political discourse. While in the pre-revolutionary period, it would have been considered a grave religious deviation with at the fusion of engineering concepts with Shi'i theology and eschatology has led to the articulation of novel conceptions such as geometry of theology, geometry of religion, and, and, and geometry of religious knowledge, geometry of expectation, geometry of Mahdism, uh, and, and, and a, a key uh, political concepts in, in concept in Iran, and more importantly, divine geometry, which is used specifically by the supreme leader to refer to the Islamic Republic system. Now, all of these, my further argument is that these are spatial concepts. They have, they are concepts that have to do with the regulation of spaces, whereas the constitutional revolution was biopolitical, and, and it had to do with the disciplining of bodies, disciplining of individuals. The, what is called Islam, what is called Sharia within Islamic political discourse, Islamic system, is actually a mode of spatial governance. And that spatial governance determines through legislation, determines who should enter in this two particular space, who shouldn't, who have access, who shouldn't, and, and how individuals could be cultivated culturally, politically, within political institutions, and, and the whole system that has to do with Hendese, geometry, with engineering, all of these have very important legislative approaches. For example, when you look at uh, this notion of uh, cultural engineering, it has to do with who gets admitted to universities, who doesn't, what kind of tests you have to pass, what kind of books should be published. All of these, while there are concepts of, concepts of engineering, it's closely wedded to uh, 
to, um, to legislative processes and, and laws and regulations. So, and what is also interesting uh, here is that we often think of <coughs> Iran dominated by clerics, but because of this ascendancy of engineering political discourse, you have now in key political positions in Iran, people who are, in our own descriptive language, multidisciplinarians. You have people who are referred to as Hujjatul Islam Muhandes. There are, there are people who are graduates of seminary schools with engineering degrees, or people who have received their engineering degrees and they have thought that they can advance much better within the, within the Islamic political landscape by getting also a degree from the seminary school in Rom or Mashhad or maybe Karbala uh, and Najaf. So, so the, it, in a sense, you also have a new class of Islamic specialists emerging that has nothing to do nothing to do in a sense, it, it, it's epistemically, foundationally. They are not trained in the very same way that seminarians were trained in pre-revolutionary period. For example, many of the people who are designates and deputies of the supreme leader of Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, almost always are these Hujjatul Islam Muhandises, people who have double degrees in seminary schools and in engineering schools. And also the conceptions has come to influence the way Islamic Republic is described. For example, Velayat Fari, the key concept that gives the supreme leader uh, ultimate authority, Khamenei himself, has argued that the most technical definition of Velayat Fari, Valiye Fari, what is uh, uh, often translated as uh, jurist guardian, is the engineer of the Islamic system, a site of engineering of the system. So the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic views himself as a, as a system engineer. And uh, thus, what is, I, I think, important to recognize that often within the political discourse, uh, European, uh, Canadian political discourse, we, we have this sort of uh, conception of Islam that sounds very medieval, backward, pre-modern, but what we see in Iran actually doesn't have much to do with that. And I, and I think it's very important to understand it because the mode of governing, while it's under the umbrella of Islam, it, it may not have as much to do with Islam. I've come to conclude that, for example, the, the mode of thinking of Ayatollah Khamenei, who is the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic, it's all the key concepts that he uses comes from engineering. Actually, the Islamic content of it is minimum. And uh, the, just one, one final uh, point that I want to uh, Note is that th th this notion that I introduced, cultural, cultural engineering, one of these uh, clerical engineers who has sort of defined it, he argues that cultural engineering, successful cultural engineering, means increasing the velocity to obey over the velocity to revolt. That is, engineer consensus, and, and the regime has become really master of, of engineering consensus, finding various ways of creating conditions that people will side with it more than oppose it. And, and this uh, election that is coming up would be a great challenge for it. With that, I, thank you. Thank you. Um. Thank you for these uh, exciting presentations. Uh, and uh, as you can see, this panel basically is the natural flow of the earlier panel. 
where earlier this morning we discussed ideas about uh, the relationship between law and revolution and what's the role of law du during the revolution. Uh, we're now at the stage of, so what comes afterwards? We had revolution, now what? And uh, so we discussed, it's a discussion of um, the role of constitutions and constitution making. And uh, there were dis the division was that um, Professor uh, Baba focused on substance. So what goes into the constitution, mainly the relationship with Islam uh, or religion in general. And uh, the other two presentations focused on uh, the, the process. So it was a complementary uh, uh, panel. I just want to raise a few points about uh, the first presentation by uh, Prof uh, Professor Baba, which is, um, I think the idea of comparing the ideas that were raised on the discussions on Islamic constitutionalism with the situation in the West is really good. I think you did a great job by uh, showing that some of the doctrines and some of the ide constitutional ideas, um, such as sovereignty, for example, uh, in the West, which are thought of as secular, actually have religious uh, roots and religious uh, history. Uh, and that similar, similar thing could happen in uh, uh, Muslim or Islamic countries. Uh, but also there was, in the presentation, there was always sometimes a distinction between uh, Muslims or um, Islam and Muslims, and what Islam says and what Muslims do. And the question here becomes is, uh, uh, can we really make a distinction between what is written in a book or what religion is perceived by some and what is the practice in reality? Um, so if we, some people, for example, read the Quran or see the Islamic teachings and see many universal uh, values in them that are very conducive to um, values such as justice, equality, et cetera, but the others would see the other things. So is the, this distinction um, actually helpful in this situation when we see that the people who are leading the um, political activism, which is considered to be Islamic political activism, are people who uh, tend to be mostly on um, one side of the argument? Uh, the other question, the other issue is uh, that Professor Baba talks a lot about reference to Sharia in the Constitution, uh, which is not a new thing, for example, in the Egyptian Constitution, because reference to Sharia was there before um, 2011. Uh, the question is here, is it the problem or is the issue reference to Sharia or implementation of Sharia? Because reference to Sharia could be uh, could have any really any uh, um, uh, interpretation or meaning, and the Supreme Court of Egypt actually did interpret it in a way, or the Constitutional Court did interpret it in a way to actually me make it more as um, um, in a way meaningless. Uh, but on the on the other hand, when we talk to people like, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood or in uh, Salafis or more traditional, when they talk about Sharia and reference to Sharia, they actually mean more implementation of Sharia teachings. Um, although, if we look at the practice, we'll see that it happens only when they suits them when it suits them. And the example of the um, debt, uh, the bonds, Islamic bonds in uh, uh, in Egypt. Uh, is a good example. Uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood, the government of the Muslim Brotherhood issued a law for issuing Islamic bonds, what were called Islamic bonds, when everybody who had any knowledge of Islam or knowledge of Islamic law said that these bonds or this law that were, these bonds that were issued are called Islamic bonds, they have, they, they are in contradiction to Islamic law. So, this leads me to the, to the next point that I'm going to make about uh, the issue of process where uh, Professor uh, Hamoudi uh, made, gave the examples of how constitutions that uh, were made in uh, really, um, we can say in a democratic way, were used afterwards by people who were uh, opponents to the constitutional process or the constitutional making process. And uh, this 
basically comes the question of what is the relationship between constitution making, constitutional law, and politics. Um, and I want to end with um, a question to P Professor Tavakoli that uh, probably after Professor uh, Berger finishes, he can answer, which is, does this idea of uh, geometry, could it be used also by people who are opposed to the idea of uh, the Islamic regime or the idea of Islamism in order to uh, use it as, for example, in the situation in Iraq where Sunnis used the constitution in order to get uh, more rights or, or as part of the political process. Could this idea of geometry be used by people who are not Islamists in order to um, further and promote their own agenda? Um, thanks. thanks so much and thank you. Uh, Mazen for kind of giving a sense of the panel as a whole. I also wanted to say a special um, thank you, just by way of underscore, to my colleague uh, Hangame Saberi for the leadership uh, in pulling this uh, wonderful day together. Um, three wonderful papers, and thank you so much. I just want to uh, speak to a point or two um, raised by each. Um, I, I suspect more and less helpful. Um, uh, Faisal, um, a, a very interesting paper, and um, uh, putting uh, just at the outset and then moving on from it, the notion that um, I think it um, interesting and important that we keep um, the idea that innovation and uh, traditionalism are both modern uh, responses, um, that uh, we can't draw um, traditionalism into uh, a pre-modern response and uh, innovation as the modern version of it. I think um, with that kind of in, in, in the background, I, I think what your paper draws beautifully to the front is um, how much more we're in need of constitutional theory about interpretation rather than a theory of constitutional design. Um, you, uh, um, the theory that I think we really need in your look around the world um, at the inclusion and non-inclusion of language about religion and the almost um, random uh, correlation between that and what it means in the constitutional life uh, points in a strong way to me um, to the notion that what's at stake very often in the lived um, uh, realities of law in the uh, aftermath of revolution and with new constitution has so much more to do with generating theories of interpretation than it does theories of design. Um, interpretation internal to religion, inter interpretation of constitutional orders. And in that, I think that there is some sense, and I wonder what you think about this, that the inclusion or non-inclusion of these hooks uh, gestures much more to anxieties around authority and who gets to do interpretation than it does particularly on any predictive um, uh, anticipation of whether this means religion will be in the Constitution or not, but much more to do with who becomes empowered by the references in design. So uh, I think in constitutional interpretation is something that you've really put to the forefront in that. Um, uh, Professor Ella Hamoudi, um, I, I appreciate that very much, and um, I was provoked by the notion of um, th what you describe as being pathological in the rule of law um, and its use afterwards. And uh, I think it's possible that it's pathological, but I also wanted to say that I think it's possible that what we're actually seeing is the form that law speaking um, in revolution um, takes. This is what law sounds like in times of deep transition, um, that it might be possible that it's not a masquerade, that it is what it appears to be, which is uh, constitutionalism looking a certain way in moments of transformation, no different really than uh, Lincoln's uh, irrigation of wartime powers at points of deep um, uh, division, which may turn out in retrospect to be pathological or may turn out to be the Constitution working itself out in new and interesting forms uh, in times of deep transition. So um, a bit of um, uh, possibility re-injected into pathological and non-pathological. And perhaps I'll finish um, with uh, Professor Tavakoli Tar Targi. Um, uh, one thing I'm put in mind of by your, by your description is the way in which 
and this is not helpful, I know, but it's something provoked to, um, that the geograph geometric, mathematical, organic, are also ways that we've seen religion internally imagine possibility through mystical means. And one uh, element often at play in conversations about constitutional law and religion, I think, is the bracketing off of mystical modes as being political and engaged in uh, the life of the society in a, in a strong way. But of course, all of these uh, elements uh, that you describe are at play uh, not just in the secular education, but also uh, uh, indigenously within religious traditions as well. But most to the, to the core, um, I think it interesting how, um, a, somewhat unclear perhaps, on who is doing this medical thinking and who is doing the engineering thinking. And in some senses, how in the vision that you paint, which sounds very um, compelling, I don't know enough about it to make a strong claim about that at the elite level, um, whether or not this is the way it's being spoken about over tea, uh, on the walk home from work, and whether the people get dropped out of the vision of revolution and constitution when we look at those kinds of um, uh, elite discourses. Okay. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panelists and discussants. Okay, so now we'll be taking questions, if there are any. Um, okay, this question is more directed towards Professor uh, Bob, and I'll see if I can articulate it. Well, just uh, in your the layout that you were making about the points of contact with religion and Western democracies, you point to specific constitutional uh, moments or reference where, where um, and also in the, in the Muslim world as well, where Sharia is included, the name of God is included, like in the Canadian, the preamble of the Canadian constitution. We can also make reference in the Canadian context of things like separate schools that are Catholic. I'm wondering if and that sort of pointed to as evidence that there's a merger somehow between Judeo-Christian religion and the state as well, but I'm wondering whether there's a more pervasive um, linkage between religion and the state um, that makes Western democracies Judeo-Christian that goes way back in origin to the fall of the first temple or elements of um, for the Talmudic tradition, uh, where from the first diaspora onwards, Jews were minorities within states and therefore developed a kind of relationship with the state where they needed a, a separation or needed to recognize a separation between their religion and the state. They didn't occupy a majority position. Of course, Christianity comes to birth in the Roman Empire, again, in a minority status. The development of democracy from the separation of the two of them served the, that kind of minority status for a long time till it became in, completely internalized that you would separate things in that way. And I'm wondering, just in light of the, the comment from Professor Falk about um, an increase in democratization in majority Muslim countries leads to an increase in, in Islam, doesn't, which, which seems counterintuitive in terms of our understanding of democracy, might not flow from the linkage in Western, the Western world with a version of Judeo-Christianity, which is that they are, the two are separate, the state and religion. And there might be a whole other articulation of democracy flowing out of uh, states where there's a majority religion um, that whether people are s secular in their expression of it or not, um, that, that runs up against that, that um, not that just that institutional, constitu formal constitutional understanding of the place of religion, but that more unwritten customary understanding of um, the place of re religion that's much more pervasive and, and cultural, if you want. So um, I take it you, you're looking for me to comment on that uh, interesting uh, nuance, uh, added nuance uh, and texture. I'm not, I haven't done a deep uh, historical look uh, into um, uh, the history of uh, Judeo-Christian societies and uh, the linkages with constitutional drafting and design. Um, I mean, I was really, I'm really just looking at this question whether there is a presumptive problem between uh, 
uh, having a re any reference to religion uh, or to religious norms in a constitutional document and, a, and the principles of liberal democracy. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I assert that it's impossible to maintain such a claim given the facts uh, and the facts that I, that I summarized. I think no doubt there are uh, deep uh, differences between, uh, in terms of the history uh, and the status of the relationship between religion and state uh, in different societies. Um, and I think, uh, I, th I, th I actually, I agree uh, with Professor Fox's claim this morning uh, that greater democratization will bring uh, a, a greater role uh, for Islam in public life in the, in the Arab world. And I don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think that has been true uh, in the Christian world, and I think there's lots of lots of historical reasons for that that uh, uh, I'm not I'm not really uh, equipped to go into at this moment. But thanks for your comment. Um, thank you, all the speakers. Um, my name is Ali Snashari. I'm a first year JD student here at, Os at Osgood. My question was for uh, Professor Mohammad Tavakultari. Um, I just wanted to ask, concerning the Iranian regime obsession with showing off their competitiveness with the Western world, and the fact that they are as developed, and the fact that retaining, as you mentioned, um, an engineering degree would give them legitimacy, considering the increasing um, of, the formal, um, of the Iranian's formal education system, don't you think this use of engineering um, in the government is yet another show off to show that they are being as competitive or as educated as the Western world. And my second question, I just wanted to have your thought whether um, there has been any development or a shift in adaptation of this engineering ideology since the time of Rafsanjani in 1990s, um, who carried the message of um, development and reconstruction, which is an, again another re engineering concept, to the latest development in the Iranian space programs, which it, again, is another engineering concept. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the notion of engineering, uh, one could do a genealogy of it, a genealogy of it, and in a Tocquevillian sense, one could argue that the origin of it actually goes to the Ancien Regime, the Pahlavi Regime, where the whole language of engineering began to be used initially in urban planning and then from urban planning increasingly went into educational and in the post-revolutionary period, they re really became hegemonic. But, but there, there are phases in the post-revolutionary period that uh, the whole notion of construction, reconstruction, and engineering mode of analysis is used. Initially, is post-revolutionary reconstruction. And then it becomes war period reconstruction. And post-war, reconstruction. And all of these, just imagine the way engineers be, move to the forefront. Anytime you have a constructional project, it involves engineers. It involves planning, it involves building, it involves rebuilding, and it also involves huge governmental subsidy. So in a sense, the reason that this language is taking off is that the linkage with, engin with engineers is also a, f a serious financial linkage. The, sh the shift which is really interesting is that after Khat Khatami becomes the president in uh, late 1990s, then there is a shift intensely into cultural engineering. And the supreme leader establishes this office of cultural engineering and the ar argument is that Iranians are increasingly in the post-war uh, period are withering away from Islam and how to bring them back. And the model that they have is that when people go to seminary schools, at the end they become, even when they are naughty and they don't really believe in religion, at the end become very pious. How can we do that to the entirety of the society? So in a sense, this engineering it is applied there, but then going to this question that was asked, it, it, was, it is not only the clerics that are using the language of engineering. Iranian opposition, secular leftists, nationalists, they are all using it. One of the most popular uh, the sort of diasporic song that is really a counter Iranian um, the national anthem is a poem that was written by Semin Behbahani that it starts with, I will rebuild you, oh my homeland, if need be, with bricks made of 
my soul, I will rebuild columns under your roof if it need be with my bones. The, the entire imagination here in this that, that is really very popular amongst the Iranian uh, diaspora community is engineering. And then this engineering concept is also used by, uh, by, the, by the opposition. For example, during the, uh, the past uh, Iranian election, there was a discussion of election engineering. And when the, the supporters of the regime would pour into the street, it was demonstration engineering. Uh, the so it, it has both um, state-centered kind of usage and also counter state. And the way I, I see it could be really intensely political counter uh, regime would be how individuals could begin to argue that we are engineers of our own life rather than having the Islamic Republic as a system engineer everything, how individuals could char take charge of their own life. And, and again, the, the slogans after the uh, past presidential election of where is my vote, is the, it, it's intimately linked to this assertion of individual rights and individual sort of sovereignty and control over one's, one's life. But the Islamic Republic, in a sense, wants to engineer the entirety of the system and it uses the kind of political language because of the number of Iranians who have been educated and have gone. Almost every Iranian that you see here in Toronto, they have gone to engineering school. Probably a lot of people, Iranians who have come to law, probably they had an earlier degree in engineering. And in NMC, the department that I teach, uh, at, at U of T, almost every student that we have in our PhD programs, earlier they were engineers. So there is this overproduction of engineers, and engineering language is the language of everyday life. During the Iranian Constitutional Revolution, people wanted to cure mother nation, and it's the kind of language that everyone understands. When people get enthused about revolution, they have a kind of language that is commonly understood, very easily understood, and if you have destruction, reconstructing, building, you don't need to have a degree in engineering to, to be familiar with the whole concept of building, rebuilding, repairing. So in a sense, these are the concepts that are really deeply popular, and the logic of revolution and revolutionary enthusiasm it, it's linked to this accessibility of the, these descriptive languages and planning and futural concepts. Thank you, um, So I want to go back uh, to the question of in the aftermath of the revolutions. I, you know, I think academia is um, um, sort of caught on its own discourse and it it's, it lives in a sufficiently autonomous universe that it takes it a while to catch up with what's happening outside. So, <clears throat> you know, with due respect to everything Khaled Abul Fadl has ever said about Sharia, ah, his views on Sharia ah are completely irrelevant. Um, the way Sharia ah has been incorporated in the new Egyptian constitution is actually not indeterminate at all. In fact, the way it has been inserted has been deliberately to eliminate the indeterminacy associated with its interpretation in the previous constitution. And the way they've done that is by including Al-Azhar as a supreme interpreter over the court, one thing. Second, by including specific references to the doctrines that the court needs to refer to when it interprets anything according to Sharia. And they added two new articles that are absolutely terrible that gives the society, not the state, but the society, the power to enforce public mora morality. <coughs> These additions are really scary. They do not indicate an inde a Sharia structure that is indeterminate. Of course, everything indeterminate, let's just begin with that. But what they've done, the Salafi Ikhwan um, Alliance, they have a very specific idea of what Sharia is, especially the Salafis do. And the Akhwan let them take control of the drafting process, and they included these ideas in order actually to eliminate a previous indeterminacy. And so I think when we talk about Sharia now, with the revolutions, with these new constitutions, we really need to develop a discourse that is 
quite condemnatory of these of these ideas. I mean, like, we need to oppose them because their victims are going to show very clearly very soon and have actually been showing already, mainly women and, and minorities. And um, we really need to stop this sort of discourse that we've developed over the, 20, the past 20 years under dictatorships about how Sharia is this and Sharia could be that and it could be this and we're also, we also have. This has all changed. Islamists now rule. It's a new universe, right? And I think academia needs to just sort of get on with it. I'm sorry. So I take it that that's directed at my, my remarks. Um, I did uh, offer an opinion about the process by which the, the new Egyptian constitution uh, was adopted, uh, and I characterized it as a joke. Um, uh, and I think the problem is that the possibilities for Sharia were not explored, they were not sufficiently explored. The basis of, cons of consultation was not sufficiently wide. The, 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 the question that I'm considering is whether there's a theoretical possibility that a progressive doctrine of, of Sharia could be developed, that the emancipatory uh, content of Sharia, uh, which can't be denied, uh, exists. Um, when I describe it as indeterminate, I'm, I'm embracing the possibility that Sharia can be used for absolutely nefarious purposes and given content that is uh, repugnant, uh, but also that it can be uh, uh, a progressive or an emancipatory doctrine. Uh, the, the proof is, as we say, in the pudding, and the, and the pudding that we have is pretty distasteful. I agree with you, uh, but uh, I refuse to accept a sort of determinist uh, approach with respect to this question. You can't look at what you have now and say that's all that's possible. I mean, I think that's limiting the scope of human possibility and of human imagination uh, and frankly undersells the Egyptian public and Arab intellectuals. Uh, the problem is the process. The problem is the lack of democratic process on the part of the Brotherhood. And, uh, and I described uh, what I think is the biggest problem, which is the lean towards authoritarianism. Uh, and I think if the, if the Brotherhood were to adhere to the principles or similar principles to which I've I've, that I've outlined, uh, uh, there's a possibility that they could redeem themselves. That they, I, I think th that there is a possibility that an Islamist uh, approach to liberal constitutionalism could result in a constitution that might be acceptable uh, according to generally acceptable or generally recognized constitutional norms. It may not be the ideal constitution. It may not be South Africa's constitution, which is a liberal Democrat's dream come true. Uh, but I don't believe that there is only one model of decent constitutionalism that exists out there. And, uh, and I'm not prepared to uh, accept a determinist view that says anything that has Sharia anywhere connected to it is destined or certain to fail those standards. Um, oh, sure, go ahead, jump in. No, no, go ahead. My apologies, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I thought you were finished. Um, my apologies. Um, you know, the only thing I was gonna say was the only difficulty is that the jump from whatever uh, Khalid is talking about to what the Muslim Brotherhood is saying is just as big as jump from the Muslim Brotherhood to a sort of a secularism. That is to say, the argument always in favor of uh, Sharia is, well, we have to have Sharia because the public won't accept anything else. And so Khalid says, well, here's my theory of Sharia, and then notice how it uh, affords with liberalism, and this is going to get everybody on board. But the problem is that theory isn't really anything that um, that I find recognizable in uh, in, uh, in Arab societies. Now, I suppose we could say, well, maybe they could adopt something like this. I suppose that's possible. But it's also possible that they could adopt secularism. We can, we, can, we can talk about possibilities, but that doesn't seem to be the driving force of Islamism. And that's sort of partially my answer to, I think, the question that uh, Professor um, uh, Berger, Berger Ben, ben was, uh, was presenting to me, of, you know, isn't this sort of um, the way you work things out? I mean, my concern is that what you had was a group that was concerned about its long-term electoral viability. That is, it was not, it did not find the implementation of uh, Sharia to the extent that it wanted to see whether it was the Muslim Brother and the Salafis together um, as being necessarily certain uh, and permanent in the way that, say, it was perfectly obvious that once you had a democratic society in South Africa, apartheid was gone. That, that this is just, I mean, it's not, it's not coming back. Uh, and so you can 
afford to be a little more magnanimous if you're a Mandela. Whereas the, what I view the Morsi Constitutional Declaration as doing is, let's get this over with now, forget consensus, and let's just force this down everybody's throat. You know, I suppose you could make an analogy to Reconstruction, but Reconstruction in the United States involves basically the North beating the South into submission after a brutal civil war that killed hundreds of thousands of people, and the South never really accepting Reconstruction. Once the army left, they completely reversed and forgot completely about the 14th and 15th Amendments, uh, and, uh, and uh, continued to do so until they decided to sort of get themselves involved again in 80 years, uh, 80 years later. It's just not... I mean, I, I would hope for a better, <laughs> a better, a better model. I do take your point that things that start pathologically don't necessarily end end that way. I think that's an absolutely good point. But that's my concern about the way in which these things happen. If I may jump in, one way to think of the Sharia is that what does it really mean? In the case of Iran, immediately after the Iranian Revolution, it meant imposing the hijab on women. What does that mean? In my view, it is a spatial governance. You, by people covering themselves, you can immediately identify your ideological foes and enemies. You can begin to regulate uh, governmental offices, factories, public spaces, and things like that. So in a sense, it is a mode of governing the space. And, and I think the attention should be on these implication of it rather than being sensitive to the concept because actually, the, the Sharia itself doesn't mean anything. It, me, it, it always, when it's legislated and goes through parliamentary processes, it, it comes out something radically different, and one has to see what does it do and how does it govern. And, and, and one way to do it is that, how does it regulate the part, uh, space, accessibility of the space, who is allowed in, who is allowed out, who, who can participate, who cannot participate, I think that would be a much more useful way of going uh, than just, uh, and, I, and I think the distinction, while I, I identify myself as a seriously secular, a radical secular, but I think the distinction between secularism and Islam, it also becomes not useful anymore. Because the thing is, has to do with the mode of governance, how this space is used. They use, the Islamists use uh, Islamic terminology and concepts for, for a certain legitimacy, but then they do other things. I think the Islamic Republic really had no other choice but go into this engineering mode of discourse, and they're very, very serious about it because that's the only way that you can organize, plan, anticipate. The planning process goes into it, and with just the term Sharia, you can't do it. You have to link it with other analytic uh, uh, concepts, and when you bring that into account, then, in fact, we can talk about serious issues of governance and mode of governance and the differences between one group and the other. Um, I have a question for Professor Hamoudi. Uh, with regards to the protests taking place in Iraq, um, the protesters, f to a large extent, uh, happen to be Sunnis in the Anbar province. And as you have mentioned, there is great dissatisfaction um, on the Sunni part with the government and with how things have played out over the last few years. And so my question is, how does what's happening in Iraq, I, I don't necessarily use the word revolution, but these protesters are using the word revolution. They want to start a revolution. And there are people who want to use the word Arab Spring and copy and paste it into the Iraqi context, which is very different, but my question is, these protesters are not only anti-government, but they are address one of the 13 main points that they have outlined are against two constitutional uh, articles and laws. And so it's interesting that they've started this movement based on two articles of the Constitution. So they're directly addressing the Constitution itself and they want changes, or not changes, they want cancellations of these two um, articles. So I wanted to know your thoughts on this matter and how you think, um, sorry I lost the train of my thought, um, how you think you know these protests are different from the others in the region, uh, particularly because they're so focused on the Constitution in particular. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, I don't think they're different because they're focused on the Constitution. I, do, I think they're different, uh, they're, and you're right, the, the protesters use you know, uh, 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 the language of the Arab Spring, and Al Jazeera will always use the language of the Arab Spring. I mean, the problem with it, of course, is that uh, they are a disenfranchised minority. I mean, that is a problem in a state. It is a highly divided state. I mean, so th there is fear, one should always have fear of, 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 of the high national divisions and fear of civil war and disintegration and all of these things, catastrophically, bad things can happen in Iraq. Um, but the idea that this is like, say, the, depo the, 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 the deposing of uh, Hosni Mubarak is just, is just not the case. It's just the, not the, the reality is that there's, despite the dissatisfaction of the Kurds with, uh, with uh, 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 Nouri Maliki, they, they're not demonstrating. I mean, it's just a very different dynamic. And the fears, I think, are much more about uh, 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 national division. In terms of the two articles, these two articles really deal with debathification. And that's really what their concern is about. And it's not, re it's not even, um, uh, uh, so that yes, they are absolutely calling for the revision of the debathification articles. Um, it's very different than than suggesting, which was suggested earlier, that the entire con the Constitution is some sort of conspiracy. That is to say, they, they advance constitutional arguments at the same time that they call for particular constitutional amendments. You see that you see that everywhere. People will call for constitutional amendments about something that they think is is flawed. What they would like to see is the Constitution put an end to the debathification processes. Honestly, if you just disbanded the debathification commission, my my guess is that that. That, that that argument would probably go away. So I don't really see it as primarily an argument about the legitimacy of the Constitution as it existed uh, before. I see it more as a group that is highly disenfranchised from the state, highly feels highly feels highly disenfranchised from the state, feels highly marginalized from the state in a way that is that is uh, that is you know obviously bad for state uh, 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 state uh, uh, continuity. Um, but I don't think the Constitution itself is the obstacle. Sorry. Sorry, we don't have enough time and Professor Falk wants to say something, so uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> because. Uh, first of all, thank you all for a very stimulating panel. Uh, I have a question uh, for Professor Moody, but really uh, he uh, took a sort of issue with my suggest. Uh, I didn't really mean to suggest it, but uh, you could both be a Democrat and uh, take issue with the legitimacy of the process that resulted from an electoral victory. And I, I think that's beyond question. But what I think uh, needs to be taken into account, and it refers a little bit to uh, Professor Baba's uh, presentation as well, is how do you deal with a deep polarization and alienation. See, my impression, and it may be wrong, is that the National Salvation Front doesn't want the Morsi uh, government to succeed and uh, rejects the, he, he's made these offers of national dialogue and trying to s find, I think, some common ground. And if that doesn't exist, how, how does one uh, address these kinds of questions? And I think the same issue uh, applies in Turkey today. The opposition, there's no responsible opposition. And the, respons the opposition doesn't see its future in terms of democratic procedures. And so it's committed to the failure of the governing elite, discrediting the governing elite, not making the system work. And see, that's, that's my impression, particularly in Egypt at the present time. Not the, and that doesn't mean that Morsi hasn't acted clumsily or uh, in, a, in a manner that is objectionable from a constitutional issue, but one has to look at the other side of the process as well. 
That's that's fair, Professor, and I'm happy to hear that <laughs> that I that I misinterpreted you because that means I might be right. Um, but what what uh, I guess what I would say is I to me there is a line a distinction between Turkey and Egypt. I think you had alluded to it in your remarks as well uh, that Turkey seems to be getting along better. The argument that I would make about Turkey is that you know the AKP came to power through legal processes. It was a legal party, one vote in the Supreme Constitutional Court, but nonetheless it it was a legal party and it won legally. And I think the concern with Morsi is that rather than have a dialogue that took that takes the course of years to work itself out and probably ends up with provisions that have to include references, I think, to an Islamic state, not because necessarily I favor them, but because I just think that that there's a certain reality of a, of a certain electorate. Uh, he sort of forced through provisions that were framed in a manner that was to their liking and then called for a national di dialogue. And I think the concern really is, um, you know, as, as, as one who's sort of committed to democracy, is it fair to say, look, this is not the way we should have done it. Let's start that over, right? And if you want to have an entire constitutional process that we all were agree on consensually, that's one thing. But the idea that, uh, that you can ram through a constitution and then call for dialogue, um, I think there's grounds to question and castigate the legitimacy of Morsi in a way that I don't think there is nearly to the same level uh, 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 for someone like uh, Erdogan, if one is even going to call Erdogan an Islamist only because you know they, they will say that they're committed to a secular state, but one that has sort of room for Islamic expression, which is different than what the Muslim Brotherhood seeks. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to end and we're going to reconvene in 15 minutes.